Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khayr al-mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Subhanakallahumma. La ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antil alim al-hakim. Bismillah. So welcome back to class two of the Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qairawani. Rahimahullah. One of the great scholars of the people of Medina or the Amal Ahl Medina, the Maliki Madhab. As we said, he was only four generations removed from Imam Malik. So he was very, very close in terms of time. The, the teacher of his teacher was Sahnun. So very, very close. Um, so as we mentioned last week, this is a tremendous work that covers the entirety of fiqh. It doesn't just stop with um, the five pillars. Like um, Ibn Asher, when he talks about fiqh, he talks only about the five pillars. It covers what we believe in, then what we then what we do, and then some of the extras, the adabs that Muslims ought to have. As I as I mentioned last week, and I will mention now, this was aimed primarily at children, or, of a, or nowadays people of a, of a of a of an age who have not acquired this level of of knowledge yet. Um, I was asked a question earlier today, which is related to some of this. Um, towards the end, you'll find some topics that he deals with, such as music and chess and things like that, and sort of the prohibition against doing things of that sort. And um, I was asked, well, why has he got such a, a strong view of this? And that's because of the age group to, to a degree of who he's gearing this towards. You, you err on the side of caution with children, and unlike, you know, with adults, you want to make sure that children start on the safer side rather than things about which there is some doubt. So you will take a firmer position when you're teaching things to children than you might otherwise take when people come later and, you know, deal with these topics themselves. For example, chess, you know, um, he, he, he didn't like the idea of chess or backgammon or things of that nature because he saw it especially with children, as being a waste of their time. They were not using their time in the right way when they were doing these activities. They were simply wasting the, the, the those precious years of their lives in, in an activity that he saw as not bringing them benefit. But if somebody, for example, is going to be in the army or is going to need tactics in his business or something like that, then these things could be beneficial. So he's looking on, he's erring on the side of caution. So, I mean, that's also an indication of what this particular book is aimed at is aimed at giving people a firm grasp. It's not aimed at dealing with, you know, different differences of opinion in things, particularly. It tries to give you a firm base upon which to build your deen. So he says here, going through the beginning of this, Lima Raghibta fihi. So he's, as I said, he was asked by a student of his to write this particular book. Um and to produce something that would be of benefit. And so he's talking in this introduction to the, the man who asked him this. He's going through the fact that he was asked to do this, and then he's now going to go through some of the things that was asked of him. He said, لِمَا رَغِبْتَ فِيهِ مِنْ تَعَلُّمِ ذَلِكَ or تَعْلِيمِ ذَلِكَ للولدان. Because of what you desire in this, um, in terms of this thing you've asked of me, what you've desired from this, of teaching it to children, lil wildan, kama tu alimuhum huruf al Quran. So teaching the matters of the deen that are essential for a human being to know, whether it's their basic aqidah or the things that you have to do on a day to day basis as a Muslim, in the same way that you would teach them Quran. In other words, you. Um, this is not saying that it's the same level as Quran, but it's in the same way that we try and get our children to learn Quran at an early age. We should also try to get them to learn fiqh at an early age, even before they are required to do these things. Because obviously when it comes to most of the things of fiqh and aqidah, you're not held accountable until you reach the age of bulugh. You don't have to know how to pray you don't have to know how to do wudu it's not an obligation on you until you reach the age of puberty even 
you know, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something you're held accountable for until you reach the age of puberty. But that doesn't mean that we sort of leave our kids in limbo and don't, don't teach them these things before the age of puberty. He's saying, look, we teach them Quran from a young age and we ha get them to memorize Quran. Let's also get them to, to know their basic fiqh, their basic aqidah in the same way that they know Quran. So it's imprinted upon their hearts from an early age. لِيَسْبِقَ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ فَهْمِ دِينِ اللَّهِ وَشَرَائِهِ مَا, ما تُرْجَى لَهُمْ, ما ترجى لهم بَرَكَتُهُ So that the um, understanding, the fahm of the deen of Allah um, in its entirety and the shara'i in particular, the, law, the laws relating to the deen can go to their hearts first. In other words, before all of these other things that you find in society take residence in the heart. I mentioned last time that he was living in a time when there was some dubious views of the dean that had taken prominence in the place where he where, where he was growing up. They were they the the ruling sultanate of that place was the Fatimids. And the Fatimids were quite an extreme Shi'i group who had some very strange views, which eventually, you know, kept on adapting until it becomes what's the modern Druze viewpoint. So this was the particular teaching that was going around about the society. So he wanted to make sure that the children, before they were infected by these false viewpoints, their heart had 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 some had defenses <laughs> against this by the true view, the tr the truth having taken residence therein first. True understanding of the deen. لِيَسْبِقَ To go first, إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Into their hearts. مِنْ فَهْمِ الدِّينَ The understanding of the deen. وَشَرَائِهِ And the rulings relating to the deen. مَا تُرْجَى لَهُمْ بَرَكَتُهُ وَتُحْمَدُ لَهُمْ عَاقِبَتُهُ So the barakah, the blessing of that would be then hoped for them because of their having taken this understanding. You would hope then that they would have a, a good outcome. تُحْمَدُ لَهُمْ عَاقِبَتُهُ that, that the outcome of them would be praiseworthy. In other words, they would be among the successful because of their hearts having taken all of these good qualities into them at an early age. Protects you. Obviously, there's no guaranteed protection. But if you have got an understanding and a love of the deen in your heart from an early age, you're much more likely to be protected from all of the dangers that are about you than if you have not. But I jumped to so I responded and uh, complied with your request that you asked me. Ila dalika to that. Lima rajotuhu li nafsi walaka based on what I hope for myself and yourself. Min thawabin min thawabi man allama din Allah from those who teach the deen of Allah. There is a particular thawab, man ahsanu qawla min man da'a ilallahi wa amila saliha. Who has a better qawl, what is the better thing that can be said than those who call to Allah? So, I mean, there's all of these things in the deen about the greatness of teaching the deen. In a, in, in a sense, their right actions, you have a portion of their right actions when you have given them the tools with which to do those right actions. So it's like that one. When you bring in bring somebody into the deen, you get the reward of them and every and all of the right actions that they do, and it doesn't decrease from their right action in any way. Similarly, teaching somebody. Man alama deen Allah aw da'a ilay. Those who teach the deen of Allah or call people to the deen of Allah. Wa'lam. No, and the khayr al qulubi that the best of hearts, awaha lil khayr, the one that are filled the most with good, the best hearts. This is the use of khayr in two different ways. <laughs> good in itself, khayr, and khayr meaning better than something else. So the word khayr can mean better or in the in the the, uh, the the comparative, um, or it can mean just good in general. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ خَيْرُ الْخُلُوبِ أَوْحَاهَا لِلْخَيْرِ The best of hearts are those that are 
the most, the closest towards good, the ones that, in, that are filled the most with good. And those that have the most desire for good or the most are in, the most inclined towards good, the closest towards good, are مَا لَمْ يَسْبُقِ الشَّرُّ إِلَيْهِ So this is emphasizing what he just said. So we want to make sure this good enters the hearts because the best of hearts are those into which good has entered first and 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 shar, the opposite of good, sometimes translated as evil or wrong, has not come into first. So when you uh, leave people until they're much older to teach them things, as we know, so many things enter the heart, so many it's easy to condition somebody or they can easily become conditioned by the society in which they live, by the processes of things that happen around them, by the people with whom they come into contact. And those things can then leave an impression in their hearts. Children are impressionable. When a, ch a child learns something, it becomes sort of, as, it, as the, the, the Rasul Sallallahu have mentioned, like naqsh fil hajar, like inscribing something in rock. It remains there Fully. So if the wrong thing enters the heart at that age, that thing is very difficult to remove at an early age. So you have to make sure, then he's saying, that you teach correct things to your children from an early age. Sometimes that will be teaching them the things that we're talking about here. Sometimes that means just showing them good quality, the good qualities of character. Just making sure that the company that they are in is the best of companies that you can find for them making sure that you keep them away from the worst of companies. That's a part of that. The best thing that the people who are sincere in their counsel, who give good counsel, the nasihun, the best thing they can concern themselves with. Um, and the best thing those who desire thawab, who desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them, the best thing that they can hope for is isalul khair is bringing good into the hearts of the awlad al muminin the children of the believers liyar sikha fiha so that it remains strong and deeply rooted within them the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did warn people of the dangers of youth youth is a fantastic time you have tremendous energy and tremendous strength to do things and so on and so forth. But it's also a dangerous time. So he said, Youth is one of the branches of madness. <laughs> you can easily sort of, you know, you have all of these things that can push you, pull you in any direction. You're very susceptible. So you have to be the most careful at that time. Um, so he says here, we have to make sure that that we make use of this time for our children. And by the way, as I was mentioning last time, we're talking about children here, but in many ways, a lot of us are children when it comes to our, our knowledges of, of, of the deen in this modern era. It's not something that's, you know, in our childhoods that's much impressed upon us. So, in fact, many of us are still, you know, in a state where we have not fully grown up, we have not flown the nest, as it were. This is true for many, many people up to a much older age in the modern era. I mean, as I said last time, he was 17 years old, it said, when he wrote this book. So he was already an adult <laughs> teaching children. <laughs> 17. I mean, we, you know, you hear the stories of the ages that people became great warriors like Sayyidina Ali. You know, it was already a great warrior at a young age or the ages that people got married even. I mean, people grew up very, very, very different ages to the, to how we see it today. So alerting them, again, we're talking about the children, the signposts of the deen in order how to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a sense, in existence, the Qur'an, the ayat, um, and all of the various other signposts where it's the great people of Allah, whoever it is, drawing their attention to them from a young age. Um, and the boundaries of the deen. I mean, a lot of the 
things that we are going to study here refer to the things that we can't stray beyond, the hudud, the boundaries. Within those boundaries, there's a wide road that we can follow. But a lot of the rulings relate to what you cannot go beyond. So you have to point out the edges so that people don't stray beyond them, so they're content to live within those boundaries. وَمَا عَلَيْهِمْ The other thing, وَمَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْ تَأْتَقِدُوهُ مِنَ الدِّينِ قُلُوبُهُمْ What their hearts should believe with respect to the deen. So there are things in this that he is going to go into that are the things that we have to believe. Secondly, وَتَعْمِلُوا بِهِ جَوَارِحُهُمْ And what their limbs and organs. I mentioned last time that جَوَارِح is often translated as limbs, but limbs does not quite give the best impression of it. Because it includes things like um, your mouth, what you say, uh, your ears, your, 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 what you look at, what you hear. So um, there are various different things that it refers to your, your, your arms and legs, yes, but your stomach, which you wouldn't really call a limb, or your privates, which you wouldn't also call a limb. So it's a big one, limited translation, limb, but it means all of the various things with which we interact with the world. So the the actions of the, that we undertake. Um, but in the ruya and the ta'lim al sigar, the kitab illahi yutfi'u ghadab Allah. It has been narrated from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or some say it was from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an, that teaching children the Book of Allah um, yutfi'u ghadab Allah extinguishes Allah's Ghadab, which literally means anger, Allah's displeasure with us. So for us, the ones who teach those children, if we have any, if we've done anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislike for us, by doing that, it extinguishes his displeasure with us. One of the highest things that that, that can be done. I mean, it was one of the first things, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, was the first basically to establish like a classroom for the children, for them to be taught. Um, he got one of one of the Sahabi Abdullah al Khazai, and uh, he took some money from the Bayt al Mal and gave him a salary, and taught him to teach the children the Deen. So this was established very, very, very early so in a in a classroom setting, almost not just not just parents teaching their children, but people of knowledge teaching the children of the Muslims. It happened very early. وأن تعليم الشيء في الصغر كالنقش في الحضر في الحجر. Teaching something in childhood is like engraving something into stone. And they said the opposite is like um, teaching something to somebody in adulthood is like writing something on water, on the surface of water. So that means you know if you've gone through one book that deals with with fiqh when you're an adult. Don't just think, wow, I've done it now, I've completed it. <laughs> that might not remain very, very long. So you have to keep on refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. It's a constant battle, in a sense, once we've already started learning after we've become adult. But you will find, I've met some people who've memorized Quran when they were kids. They never practice it at all. And then it takes them usually just like one read through of the Quran and suddenly it's all back there again. Because it's imprinted in their heart. So, they, you know, it might not be completely there, but they just have to practice for a few minutes and suddenly the whole thing's back again. This is the benefit of teaching at that early stage. I mean, this is something that we can take on for, with our own children. Obviously, we're not children to still be able to have that engraving. But I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. I mean, there are people who, even in adulthood, have this tremendous ability to absorb like a sponge everything that comes to them. We just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He give us that ability to absorb knowledge when it comes our way. Um, there's something else, else I should say here. We're talking about children here. And he's going to mention a hadith later about the prayer and seven years old and ten years old. But... There's something else that you should be aware of, and that is that children are children. You can't sort of be harsh with children and push them beyond the bounds and make things difficult and and painful for them. 
children have to be allowed to be children. When Imam Malik was told that there was a young child of seven who'd memorized the whole Quran, you know, if somebody said, wow, look, we found this, this child, seven years old, it's completely memorized all of the Quran. He said that he didn't like that. Because in a sense, you then denied that child any of, any of its childhood by pushing that on a child. So you have to be rafiq, you have to be gentle and merciful with children and allow them to be children to a degree. I don't know if you saw that video that's been surfacing, um, came on my feed of this uh, Turkish imam in a mosque. Did anyone see that? You know, this Turkish imam who, is, who, who finished his class with the children and then basically was playing hide and seek with them in the mosque, <laughs> <laughs> allowing them to basically be children still. I mean, they're, they're, actually, the Turks are quite good at that sort of aspect of it, in fact. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you have to have a balance between, you know, teaching them and then allowing them also to to be children and do the things that children children do. وَقَدْ مَثَلْتُ لَكَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ مَا يَنْتَفِعُونَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِحِفْظِهِ So I have laid out for you, I have given you examples, I have clarified for you. Mathaltu, I have given you mithals, but he means he's basically, you know, step by step laid out all of the things here. Um, things that ma yantafi'una bihi, things that the children will, inshallah, benefit by, by, by hefthihi, by, by memorizing them. In other words, he, he, one of the reasons he made this quite simple was that so that people could encompass it and actually remember it in the same way as he said earlier of the Quran. Um, so you'll find that people have memorized things like the, the Risale. In fact, some people, to make it even easier, have taken what he wrote and made it into a in, in, into a poetry form to make it easier for people to memorize in, of the Risale itself. Um, we obviously have Ibn Asha, which is in po poetic form and so on. But he's tried to make this simple so that children can memorize it or at least encompass the understanding of it and, main, and, and look after it as, as well as possible. Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. This is he's echoing what we should you should never say that something is going to happen or that you are going to do something tomorrow, except if you say add if unless Allah wills it, if Allah wills it. Acknowledging that these things only happen by the will of Allah. Well, you shrifuna bi ilmi, and they by by the their knowledge of this, they become people of nobility. One of the things by which a person can achieve nobility, alongside generosity and and amazing language, is knowledge. It's one of the people, one of the things that you elevate a person. You say that if if you find out a person has great great knowledge, automatically you have a respect and a and you 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 consider them to have a, achieved a nobility and a place in society. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ways that they can do it by teaching them this. And they become the people of Sa'ada, the people who achieve that, that fortunate outcome, rather than the Shaqawa, the people who are Shaqiyun Sa'id, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. The, the Sa'id is the one who ends up in the garden, the Shaqi is the one who ends up in the fire. You help them to that. Obviously, Huda is in the hands of Allah. No one can guide anybody except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills them to be guided. But you have given them all of the tools that they need to help that guidance stick. That's that's all you can do. So by teaching them this deen, by teaching them the, the truth, you, you are furnishing them with all of the instruments and tools that will help them in that. Well, and to help them act by it. And it has come down in a hadith that they are commanded to do the prayer um, seven years old. So basically they say this is when they enter the seventh year, so in terms of six years old. But again, the numbers that they are mentioning here are to do with particular societies in which these, these ages had had great significance um but even if you look at the modern education systems these ages do have some significance if you look at i think it's the the um 
not the Montessori, what's the other one? The Stein, the Steiner education. They consider six to be a, a very significant age when there, there's a change in the consciousness of the child. And then again, nine, ten, another change, skip jump in the consciousness of the child. So there are meanings that they are attached that are attached to these ages in terms of education. So they should be commanded to do the prayer at when they are entering their seventh year. And beaten if they don't do it when they're in, entering into their tenth year. Again, this is not meaning sort of beat them black and blue, <laughs> corporal punishment. It just means sort of a gentle beating, usually, as they say, over, like a, two or three times maximum over, over, over the clothes or whatever it is, like they do in some schools, but not in a way that puts people off. You know, because you, you know, you all you would do is associate the deen or Quran or prayer with somebody being very, very harsh to you. But in a way, when certain types of children maybe are going astray, sometimes the only way to put them right is through this particular method. So, I mean, it depends on the child, but it's an indication for us of the importance of prayer, even at a young age. And it's not just prayer, it's other similar things, obviously wudu would be included in this because you can't pray without wudu. Things that aren't particularly onerous, but are obligations in the deen, basically. So fasting or hajj, you would never do this to a child in order to encourage them to do it. In fact, you, you shouldn't even be asking children to fast because it's something which is too tough in many ways for a child to have to endure. I mean, as we've been seeing from the what's happened in Gaza, children have a lot less capacity to go without food and drink than adults. It affects them much more quickly. So this is only something that's applying to certain types of things that are not hard or harsh on children. Rahmah to children is a very, very important part of our, of our thing. Again, this is something that's an encouragement to the parents or the guardians of those children. It's nothing to do with the children themselves. If a child doesn't do it, doesn't pray. There's no punishment on the child for not doing that. There's no, you know, even dislike attached to the child not doing that. This is encouragement to the parents of the child. that If you want to bring your child up right, then you should be making sure that you encourage them to accustom them to the things that will make it easier for them when they do become adults. Because if you don't do this, then when a child reaches adulthood, and they're not accustomed to praying. It's very easy for them just to forget. They're not they're not used to it. So they come, they'll they'll wake up, go to school, having not done fajr because it's not something that's part of their consciousness. And then you will then have, be putting them in a position where they are being disobedient to Allah without them really being aware of it because they're adults. So you have to be careful about that. So it's on us. It's not on the children. They're they're not punished because they're ten years old not praying. <laughs> I mean, not even in a sense we're not. Punished. We're just doing. We're we're going against what we should be doing to look after the best interests of our children. Yufraqu bainahum fil madaji, and they are also kept apart in their beds. In other words, when children reach the age of ten, they're starting to become aware of their physicalness, and you know whether they're boys and girls and all those types of things. So that's the age where you should also keep them apart. They shouldn't, they shouldn't, in our, in, our, in, in our cases, I suppose, you know, if we had small houses like they used to, where, where lots of people would sleep in the same bed, then that would be the age where you would give them separate, separate, separate beds, for example, um, or separate bedrooms in the case of where we are, especially if it's a boy and a girl, those ages. فَكَذَلِكَ يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَعْلَمُوا مَا فَرَرُ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ قَبْلَ بُلُوغِهِمْ so because of all based on all of this, um, this shows us that that they should know what Allah has made obligatory on his slaves in terms of what they say, the Shahada, for example, and what they do before the age of puberty. So that when puberty comes to them, that has already taken its place in their hearts so that they are ready. For it, was second at ilahi and fusuhum, and they're 
nafs, their selves, are already tranquil with doing the matters of the deen. It's not sort of an overly burdensome thing on them. وَأَنِسَتْ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ جَوَارِحُهُمْ And their limbs have become accustomed to doing all of these things. So this is the whole, he's just, he's just reiterating the purpose of this. وَقَدْ فَارُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى عَلَى الْقَلْبِ عَمَلًا مِنْ الْإِعْتِقَادِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain actions. Um, again, this word action is not being used in the sense of things we do with our limbs. Actions in terms of belief on the heart. The actions of the heart are in terms of the things that it believes. Believing in Allah and his angels and his books and all of the samiyyat and all of the things that he's going to go, go through. Basically the six pillars of iman and all of the other things that follow from them. وَعَلَى الْجَوَارِحِ الظَّاهِرَةِ عَمَلًا مِنَ الطَّاعَةِ And he has made a farth on our jawarih, our bodies, um, certain things that are acts of obedience. And he's going to go, go into all of them. وَسَأُفَصِّلُ لَكَ And I will now go into detail, bit by piece by piece, all of these things that we have just mentioned here. ما شرّت لك ذكره what I have taken upon myself made it a condition upon myself to mention to you بابن بابن chapter by chapter. So he's now saying, look, okay, you've asked me all of these things. I've undertaken now to comply with your request. I know you ask in general terms about what you believe and what you what you do, but to make it more complete and easier, I'm going to go through this systematically. Chapter by chapter. Inshallah. So that it becomes to make it easier for those who are learning what I'm teaching to learn it. I mean, we arrange things in course books and chapters and in certain numbers of this and that, you know, in lists, just simply because that's easier for the human being and the human condition to acquire knowledge in that way. I mean, obviously, different peoples in in different languages, their their brains work in different ways. But uh, for everybody, when things are done systematically, it becomes easier for them to get it. I mean, some of the Andalusian scholars, I suppose, being quite European, um, like Ibn Jose and others, they seem to always number things in tens or twenties, because like that that. Particular number of things was something that you know you can easily grasp and remember. So if you remember there's twenty of something, then you can sort of go down the list of them. In other in other ones, they have sixteen or twelve or whatever it is. But they they often put things in certain numbers to make it easier for us to digest. Insha'Allah Taala. Again, he says, if Allah wills, wa iyahu and Allah nastakhiru. So this is something that seems, you know, quite a simple thing. It, it, Allah, we ask for help, or, or we ask for good, nastakhir. But there's a reason for, that he's doing this, and that is, I mean, a lot of you will have heard of Salat al-Istikhara, or Istikhara in general. Basically, this was one of the practices of the Muslims, and one of the things the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us, that we should do Istikhara in all matters, especially matters of importance. What does doing istikhara mean? Obviously, this is istikhara is, is only for matters that are not obligate, obligatory on us. We don't ask Allah for good before embarking on our prayer, because this is something he's required us, and we know there's good in it already. But if something is optional, and we don't know where the good lies for us, then we do istikhara. And there's 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 a hadith about this where the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, so it says here that he taught us istikhara in all matters just as he taught us surahs of the Quran as important as that in a sense and he said if any of you resolves on a course of action when presented with a choice um, he should do two rakats should pray two rakats and they say that should be kafirun in the first and had in the second so especially when you're coming upon a choice in your life say you know, for us nowadays, you, you, which school you're going to go to or um, whether you want to marry somebody or not, or I suppose many people, whether they want to start a particular business or 
go in a particular on a particular journey or whatever it is, um, you do this istikhara. And then you say, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmik wa astakhiruka bi qudratik wa alukal min fadlik al azim al azam fa inna katalamu wa la alam wa taqdir wa la akhir wa anta alam al ghuyub. And there's a whole long dua. I'm not going to go through the whole of the dua, but it's all mentioned in this particular hadith. But it's everybody who's ever done istikhara, or this is found even in our diwan, the diwan of Shaykh Muhammad ibn al Habib, in the duas at the end of the, of, of the wirt. He mentions the whole of this. In fact, he adds some of his own words to this. So it's not exactly the wording mentioned by the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some some people can add to it, but it's the whole purpose that you are embarking on something. Then you're asking for Allah if there is good in it that He makes the thing happen to you. If there is bad in it that He you know guides you to another course of action, and then that's the course of action that you choose. This is the basic thing. Um, and he also said, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I'm not going to say the Arabic here. He said, Anas, if you resolve on something, if you have a particular intention of doing something, or you have an action that's in your heart to do, then do istikhara, seek the good seven times. Um, so that could be saying this dua seven times, not necessarily doing the two rakats each time. And he says, then look at what comes into your heart and that is where the good lies. So this is just an example of how istikhara might work. So he says here, Yahu nastakhir. We ask for good in this endeavor. This is a, an endeavor of importance. So he's asking for good in it. Wabihi nasta'in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can give help. So we seek help by him. Mentioned in the Fatiha, Yakan Abu Dhabi Yakan Astain. Wala Hawla, Wala Kuwata, Illa Billa Hil Ali Al Avim. There is no Hawl. Our Imam was talking about this in the Khutbah the other day. La Hawla, Wala Kuwata, Illa Billa Hil Ali Al Avim. Hawl comes from changing or moving aside from something. So no one can, can turn you aside from wrong actions. No one can stop you falling into wrong actions except Allah. No one can give you the power to do good actions except Allah. You have no power over anything. There is a story of one of the, one of the um, people of Allah who was captured. And um, he said that when he was captured by the enemy, he was put in, in the middle of their camp in a, in, a, in a prison. And he said, all he did was say, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, and kept on saying it and saying it and saying it. And he was tied up with, you know, strong knots. And he said the knocks fell loose. And he was able to walk out from the midst of the enemy camp, find the place where the camels were, take a camel and escape just by saying, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, with, with, with the intention and the understanding of what it means. I and mean, this is the strength and the power of this particular this this particular sort of dua or this particular dhikr. It was the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said it was one of the treasures of the garden, one of the treasures of Jannah. And we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to pour down the blessings on our master Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his prophet and all of his all of his al and all of his sahab and to give abundant peace upon them so again he's we mentioned yet last time I'm not going to go into again but no good comes from anything except that the salawat of the, the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam are in it so here it was mentioned at the beginning again now it's mentioned in the middle, or it could be said at the end of the introduction. So sandwiching all of the du'as that he's made within there, within the salawat of the Rasul, to make it more accepted. It's like when you cover, a, you know, a, if you want something to be accepted by a king, you you put make the, the outer of it something that he <laughs> likes the look of, and then you can hand it to him, and he's more likely to accept it. <laughs> so this is where we start proper. This was the introduction. Why he wrote this? Now he's starting with the with the book proper, Bab. 
So uh, he's already said, Babum Baban. He's, he's going to go through this Bab after Baba, literally a, a door or a gateway. But we often translate this as a chapter because that's more the word we use. Or sometimes you might say a book, the book that relates to this. But anyway, this is the first segment of this, which is Aqidah or the things that we believe in. So he says here, Babum Ma Tantiqu Bihil Al Sina. What the tongues enunciate, what the tongues profess, um, and the hearts believe. Again, you should have to be careful with the word belief, or even the word faith, because faith has connotations as well. But the English translations of, of i'tiqad and iman are not perfect. Really, what we're talking about here is knowledge of Allah. Knowing what your heart knows with respect to Allah, what you've learned by looking at the signs. We're not talking about belief in the English sense of could be or it might not be. I believe that so-and-so is in the house. You don't know. You're just sort of making a calculated guess. That's not what we mean by belief. Belief is knowing in your heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then you can that, that, that can be strengthened to certainty there, I mean this is already certainty but it can you know that that certainty can be strengthened and strengthened by the more signs you see but it's a it's a it's a knowledge it's not simply a the best a best guess scenario the word afida for ad is often said to be a synonym for qalb heart you'll see the word afida in the quran quite a lot but some actually say that though no the for ad is the part of the heart that is the vehicle of perception. So it's what deals purely with the perceptive capacity of the heart as, a, as something that, um, you know, can believe things, something that can know things, rather than the heart as a sort of pump or a motor or something like that, which the word qalb would include all of it. Fu'ad is not referring to that aspect of, of the heart being a, a part of the body that pumps blood around. It's referring to the part of the, the the aspect of the heart that is something that can know things, something that can be aware of things, um, something that can believe things. So, I mean, some people would associate that with the mind, for example. But the heart is not the same as the mind. In a sense, you could say that the mind or the brain is the servant of the faculties. When we see, well, the, the things that our, our vision encompasses then go back into our mind and it uses the mind to then understand, un unravel what they mean and then it comes back to us so we, so, so we understand what we've seen and so on with hearing. And you can say that the, basically the heart is basic when you, when, you, when you have things like knowledge is making use of the mind to then unravel that for the perception of the heart. Just like the sight would you make use of the mind and so on. It's like the, the mind in a sense could be almost be considered the servant of all of the other faculties. Min wajibi umur dianat. So tante kubihil alsin. Obviously, just before he says, when he says the the tongues enunciate, he means obviously the people making use of that tongue. The, the tongues don't speak on their own accord. They they, they we we are the ones who. Um, they, they, it says about the the tongue that the tongue is the tarjuman al qalb, the uh, translator of the heart. <laughs> so basically. What you, as a as as a person, want to say within your being, the the tongue then makes it clear so that other people can understand what what you are what, what you are wanting mm -hmm. to say. It sort of translates on behalf of you so that the world about you can understand what's happening. of the things that are obligatory of the matters of this dean. So he's talking here in, the, in this in this section on, on aqidah of the things that are obligatory for us to believe. Diyanat is one of the pearls of deen, but I mean it means it means it means every deen that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has sent. This you know aspect of belief in Allah is present in all of it. Omin dalikal imanu bil qalb. 
So he goes through them now step by step. The first part of this is Iman. وَمِنْ ذَٰلِكَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالْقَلْبِ وَالنُّطْقُ بِالْلِسَانِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ So he mentions two things here. He mentions لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ As he comes to now. That is something that in order for us to have Iman, in order for us to be considered a mu'min, to have fulfilled the obligations of this, we have to say it on the tongue and believe it in the heart. You're not considered a mu'min until you've done both. This does not mean that if somebody sort of believes in their heart that uh, there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, وسلم, but they never say it on their tongue that they're going to the fire. That's not what we mean. Between them and Allah, belief in the heart is enough for them to be considered a believer. But in this world, if you want to, to somebody to be treated as a Muslim, as a mu'min, as a believer, buried as a believer, um, to have all of the rulings attached to him of the believer, in the sense that he can inherit from Muslims and so on, then he has to have done these two. He has to have said the shahada on his tongue and believe it in the heart. Obviously, we don't know if he's believed it in the heart. But I mean, if you want to be a mu'min with Allah and with people, you need both of those. If you only have it on the tongue but not in the heart, then you'll be treated as a Muslim, but then you won't be accepted by, by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a believer. If you only have it in the heart but not on the tongue, you might be accepted, you will be accepted by Allah as a believer, but you won't be accepted by society as a believer. There's obviously a third part to this, which is it having an appearance on the limbs as well. Your, your limbs corresponding to what you believe in the heart and say on the tongue. That's considered to be what's called a shartu kamala, something by which your iman, your belief is perfected. But not something that means that without it, you're not considered a, a believer. You're considered a believer even if you don't pray, or you don't fast, or you don't go on hajj. That's the, that's the general position that majority of us take. You're still considered a believer even if you don't do those things. If you say there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and obviously we don't know what's in the heart, but obviously believe it in the heart, then you are a believer. But you have not reached the perfection of belief, which is that belief extending beyond your tongue and your heart into your limbs, so that they purely act out as out of ta'a, of obedience to Allah, and avoid what is forbidden. When we say that um, somebody who doesn't pray is not a believer, that's that's only referring to the people who say it's not obligatory to pray or say it's not obligatory to fast. People who, who claim that something which is clear in the deen is not so. Something which is mentioned in the book of Allah, they say, no, 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 that's not real. That's when somebody leaves Iman. You understand? So if some, for example, says something which is clearly haram, like say, say, let's say stealing. They, stealing is perfectly acceptable if somebody claims something like that. And it's not against what Allah has commanded. That that is then kufr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, uh, that stealing is, is forbidden and it's known <laughs> that stealing is forbidden. So, I mean, even when it comes to things that are not acts of worship, claiming against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear is very, very dangerous and takes you out of being a, a mu'min. But um, simply not doing those things or doing those wrong actions without making claims about them does not take you out of iman. Allah wahid. La ilaha ghayru. That Allah is one God. There is no God but Him. So this first thing that he is stressing here is what we call, well, there's two things here. If you remember from Ibn Ashir and the Jawhara to Tawheed, we talked about the Ash'ariya, the way they differentiate it, is they talk about the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They differentiate our belief in Allah into his sifat. And they mention the first of the sifa, nafsiya, being wujud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. 
he mentions that here and it says by saying that Allah is one God. You already said that he is. And the second one that they mention, um, or the monks of them, that they are the, what called the Sifat Salbiya, the, the, the Sifa, the, the sort of attributes that negate something because you can't really, they're not meanings in that sense. You can't encompass exactly what they are. For example, we can't encompass beforeness or afterness or complete oneness because we are, those, those things are not within the possibility of the human brain, brain to encompass as a meaning. So they're called the Sifat Salbiya. They negate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their opposites. And here he mentions the first of those, or he indicates the first, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being one. Absolute oneness. Nothing there alongside him. No God, but in fact, absolute oneness. There's nothing. He, he is one in terms of his essence, one in terms of his attributes, one in terms of his actions, which implies that there is there, there is only one actor in existence. So I mean, this is the first the first thing. La ilaha, and Allah ilahum wahid. Allah is one God. La ilaha ghairu. There is no one worthy of being worshipped alongside Him. And ilah, in a sense, is one who everyone everything has need of, and he uh, he has need of nothing, not, of no one, of nothing. That's what ilah is. وَلَا شَبِيهَ لَهُ وَلَا نَظِيرَ لَهُ And there is nothing that is like him or resembles him. Um, and لَا نَظِيرَ لَهُ And there is nothing that is like him. So there are two things that basically mean the same thing. We also find in كُلُّ اللَّهُ هَدْ كُفُوا أَنْ أَحَدْ There is nothing that's similar to him. Or لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ As he says in the Quran, there is nothing that is like him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no... Comparable being alongside him. That means not like him in any aspect. They don't have attributes that are the same as him. This is the interesting thing about Laysa Kamithi Hishay. What does it say after that? Wahua Sami ul Basir. Laysa Kamithi Hishay. Wahua Sami ul Basir. So Sama is hearing and Basar is seeing. It calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the seeing and the hearing in this particular ayat. Just after saying that there's nothing like him. So obviously we appear to have hearing and we appear to have sight. So it seems like he's saying that there is something like him, but there isn't something like him. So what do we understand from that? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sam' and basar is not like ours. It's not... Uh, something that makes use of eyeballs or that makes use of ears, for example. Um, it's basically something that's like knowledge, but encompasses a different aspect of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of, in a sense. So you say when they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sami', it's not just hearing sounds, but you might hear objects, hear colors. And you know, that, I mean just just to give a crude example, because it's far beyond that or see sounds, or whatever it might be, you know? So it's far, far more than than what we have. In a sense, we have a borrowed attribute, in a sense. It's not this, there's no there's no similarity to it. And when we see, we often then can close our eyes and we don't see. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sight is constant. There's no times of seeing and times of of not seeing. وَلَا شَبِيهَ لَهُ وَلَا نَظِيرَ لَهُ وَلَا وَلَدَ لَهُ وَلَا وَالِدَ لَهُ So he does not have any child. Nothing separates from him. Nothing came from him that is the same as him, that is of his of his essence. And he did not come from another essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's got no, nobody... You know, he's he's not... Basically, this is another, this is another way of saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Is before is one is one without beginning, and there is uh, nothing like him because he is the unique one. Well, sahiba, he doesn't have a spouse. Allah subhanahu wa taala does not have anybody of the same the same level as him. He doesn't have anybody with him. There's Allah subhanahu wa taala is one. Um, before existence, there was him, <laughs> and he is as he was, as they as they famously say. 
By the way, when we say la ilaha illallah, that, that's part of iman, just to be clear here. When we talk about these two things, and he only mentions la ilaha illallah, that's not com a complete iman for us. Iman includes Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is an essential part of iman. Without, without it, you cannot be considered a mu'min. You need la ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah, the two parts. Can you ask them to not? Laisa kamithli hishay. So this, 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 um, la shabiha lahu wa la nadira lahu wa la walad lahu wa la walid lahu wa la sahib lahu wa la sharika lahu and no partner with him. Uh, these the, these are emphasizing both oneness and the fact that uh, we we talked about this before that mukhalafatun uh, al what is referred to in some of the other books as being different to everything that is created. Because um, if you uh, you know as soon as you apply as soon as you say something can be like Allah subhanahu wa taala then whatever that thing is, um. It is created because there's only one creator. Then, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can be like it, then He must also be created because He has the same attributes of it. The same things that describe that describe Him. And if something is this is the same as something else in terms of the qualities that it has, then the same outcomes happen to that. Laisa <laughs> li. So these are two more of these sifat salbiya, as we call them elsewhere, um, which is which are called qidam and baqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadim and baqi. So that means that there is, in terms of Allah being the first, there is no beginning to him being first. So Allah is the first, but he's not the first in the sense that. There was nothing, then there was a first, then there was a second, then there was a third. Because when we count, we start from naught often, don't we? Then we go to one, two, three. So one is just is just the first. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first without any anything preceding him. And he is last without anything coming after him. And um so this is imp important to to realize this particular aspect of of things that you know, everything in existence has a has a starting point. Everything that we know of in existence has a starting point. The proof of, by, by the way, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has no ending point is in the fact that He has no starting point, because that means that there's an infinite amount of space time that has gone. Even time is created, so it's a, we can't really talk about time in that sense. But the, but it's infinite. So if something is infinite. In the past, that means it must continue to be infinite in the future. Because if it was infinite in the past, if there was an ending for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, it would have already happened. So I mean, that's obviously clear that there can't be. But I, but again, we're we're thinking of things in terms of time, and Allah is the creator of time. La yablughu kunha sifatihi al wasifun. So uh, the, no, nothing can reach the essence of his attributes. Uh, no one can, can describe the essence of his attributes. So if you can't describe the essence of the attribute, if you can't even take one of the attributes, let's say knowledge, and accurately get an understanding of what that is, you wouldn't be able to understand the essence even more. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be described. Whatever thought you have about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, he is different to that. Whatever image you form and try and say God is like this, he is not. So no person, no matter how great their ability to reflect and to think, the greatest thinkers of the age, even if you got all of those thinkers to put all of their thoughts together, they cannot encompass the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not possible. The human being, the created being, his created thoughts cannot encompass the uncreated, the creator.
يعتبرون المتفكرين متفكرون بآياته ولا يتفكرون في ما هي ذاته. So when you come to do reflection, we are encouraged to do reflection. We're encouraged to reflect on the Quran. We're encouraged to reflect on the world around us. But we're not encouraged to reflect directly on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence or directly on his, att his attributes. As if we can somehow, the more we reflect on those attributes, understand, understand them. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this world in which to live and has given us these signposts and that's the only thing that we have the capacity to reflect on and if we truly reflect on them then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us knowledge of himself and of his attributes but you can't then focus and reflect on on that is not something that the fikr the thinking can reflect on there might be sort of certain levels of knowledge of awareness or taste that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you like people of great knowledge of and so on, but they can't then explain what they've understood in words or reflect on them to people. So it's not possible. None of it can be encompassed in that way. Um, there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, for example, that we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next life. This is known. But again, you, you you have to be careful when you reflect or think on that, that you don't misunderstand. That you don't think that you're, you, you've understood that your eyes are going to see something, that a shape or whatever it is. Never never think on that. La tudrikuhu absar. Allah also tells us in the Quran, sight will never reach him, will never encompass him. So we have to accept that these things will happen, but we can't sort of be reflecting upon how they will happen because that's very very dangerous it can lead you into false understandings a lot of the issues that have affected the muslims over the age have been through the bathaniya the people who've claimed certain understandings of the deen based upon their reflections or whatever it is um or you know certain actions they then attribute with certain types of understanding and so on and so forth but, re but reflecting on the wrong things can be very, very, very dangerous. Just reflect on the multitude of signs that we have everywhere, the multitude of ayats, both in terms of the... We, you can say there are a number of facts. There's the world around us, ourselves. or Because, um, you know, even when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, was asked to describe who is the Lord of all the worlds by Fir'aun, he didn't then go into some description of of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, he is the Lord of you and the Lord of your forefathers. And he said, he is the uh, Lord of the, the heavens and the earth. Um, and he, he described things in this way for for Fir'aun. For, for he didn't describe, he, by, by the ayats, by the signs that are, that are around. He didn't go into details about, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's form. Because that's not something that the human being can ever understand or encompass. So the next part, um, I will leave until next time because we've reached time and it's the Ayat al-Kursi. So as you'll see when we go through the book of Aqidah, he quotes a lot of Ayats of Quran or lots of things that are very, very that, that bring to mind ayats of Quran. Sometimes he uh, puts things together in a slightly different way, but they are this. Bas this is basically the way he teaches aqidah. He doesn't do the method that we found before of saying there are, you know, twenty sifat and there, are, you know, twenty things that you have to believe in and twenty things that are impossible and so on and so forth. Instead, he simply. Tells you all of the the names of Allah and the attributes of Allah and the things that Allah subhanahu wa taala said about Himself. This was the way of the Salaf, the early generations. The way they they described Allah doesn't mean that um, they took all of these things literally, though. You have to be careful to understand that even if they quote something, it doesn't mean that they took it literally, because there are certain things that they would automatically dismiss as being impossible for Allah subhanahu wa taala based on their understanding that Laysa commit the Hishay. There's nothing like Him. So we're going to come to one next time when he talks about Fawq um, al-Arsh, above the throne.
And obviously certain peoples that we know interpret this in a particular way to attribute a direction, even though they even though they say we don't know how or whatever it is. But we don't even, they didn't even enter into any, any interpretation. They didn't ask the question, where is Allah? Which is the problem once you start asking that question, then the if you, and then you say something like above the throne, then you've already implied direction. They didn't even ask ask questions of that nature. So when he says something that that, that on the surface, the meaning of it may seem to be sort of you know something that you have to disassociate a lot from. You've got to realize that the early salaf they just accepted the ayats as they were, and they didn't want to, for example, with folk say that it specifically meant power or it specifically meant um, sovereignty or whatever it is. They didn't want to specify the meaning into one thing because then they would be limiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or saying that that is exactly what he meant and they didn't know for sure that that was what was meant. So they were they just left it as it was. While at the same time acknowledging that direction is impossible. You understand? I mean, for example, with folk, even in English, above, we might say the president is above the foreign minister. Does that mean that he's actually on top of him or physically above him? No. So language has different usages for different words. And they understood that, So, they, but they weren't going to say what the interpretation of the word was. Are there any questions? Well, when you are when you have a particular course of action that you want to embark upon, you choose a time when prayer is allowed before you've embarked on that course of action and do your istikharam before you've actually made your choice. So maybe any time that's not between Asr and Maghrib or at the time of uh, of, of sunrise. So is that a question online? Yeah, Barakallah Fiqh, Salaam Alaikum. Um, I, I, I heard from um, a Maliki Fiqh teacher that you shouldn't do istikara if you've got Qadar. Is that something you've heard? Uh, no, Qadar. I haven't heard that. I mean, because when you have Qadar, if the if the qada is under five or six prayers, then yes, you shouldn't do it until you've made up those prayers. But if you have, you know, years worth of prayers or anything more than that, then you basically usually pray a certain amount each day in order to make them up. And then you can still then do your non-obligatory prayers alongside that. Okay. But, I mean, you wouldn't even pray, 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 pray your chef and witter until you've done the the part of prayers if you've only got a small amount of them and you remember. Well, we're going to go. We're going to go a little bit more. There's another question here about the Salafi understanding of the slave girl hadith. But we, but we, we, we're, we're going to deal with this. This is actually part of next week's lesson where he actually specifically mentions this. So we're going to leave that until we we discuss that. I mean, as I as I as I said, you know, we don't take things literally, and there's a, there's a basic words of understanding things that uh, every human being knows up up means means elevated and. You never use the word under for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or beneath um, because of the interpretations of that word. So, I mean, that particular one of, of, of looking up is not implying direction, it's implying aboveness. <laughs> but anyway, we'll discuss it more next time. Are there any other questions? Online? No? Okay. Basiru barakati, bismillahir rahman rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Din, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem, Sirat Al-Ladhina Anamta Alayhim, Aghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim Al-Dhaleen, Ameen, Allahumma Salli Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Abdika Wa Rasulik Nabi Lumi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Salli Muslima, Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Azati Ma Asifum, Wa Salaam Al Muslim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah Thank you.